I have three scriptures to read to you tonight. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. I shall read it to you. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward unhungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The next two readings are found in the same chapter, Luke's Gospel, chapter 24. Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, the Lord is with the couple, the Emmaus Road couple, verse 25. Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things? and to enter into his glory. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. The final reading down to verse 44. The Lord is now speaking to the disciples. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. If I was to put a title on tonight's meeting, I would give it the title of the Lord's Knowledge of Scripture and the Lord's Use of uh, Scripture. You may be aware that there is a society in our country called the Society for the Distribution of the Hebrew Scriptures. And the Hebrew Scriptures would be what you and I would call the Old Testament. And if I was to ask those in the hall and those on Zoom tonight, how many books in the Old Testament, we would all shout out 39. Now, it may surprise you to know that in the Hebrew Scriptures, there are 24 books. But the content is the same as our Old Testament. So there's the conundrum. 39 books in our Old Testament but 24 books in the Hebrew scriptures. The apparent discrepancy can be explained by the fact that you and I speak of first kings and second kings, they don't. It's just kings. And the same would apply to first Samuel and second Samuel, they just call it Samuel. The same would apply to Chronicles. And you and I, we have the book of Ezra and we have the book of Nehemiah. They link them together into one book, Ezra, Nehemiah. And as for the 12 minor prophets, they present them in one book. And so the the Hebrew scriptures have been divided by the Jews into three divisions. The first five books, they call it the Torah, the writings of Moses. Then the next division is the prophets. And the official name, the Jews would call it Navim. Now, I'm going to read out the list of books that they put in the prophets, and I want you to listen carefully and see if you can spot the missing prophet. Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, the Twelve, that is, the Twelve Minor Prophets. Did you spot the missing prophet? Strangely, Daniel is not found in the prophets. 
he is found in the next division of the Hebrew scriptures, the writings. The writings would include, would start with the book of Psalms, Proverbs, Job, Song of Songs, Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, Esther, Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Chronicles. So I read from Luke chapter 24, verse 44, and Howard quoted it in prayer. The Lord divided the scriptures into three parts. In the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms. This threefold division of the Hebrew scriptures, it existed in the days of the Lord. And he used them as the basis for speaking to those disciples in the upper room. Now, before we move on, the first division, the writings of Moses, the Torah. Was Moses a prophet? Well, we are told in Deuteronomy 34, but since then there has not arisen in Israel a prophet like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Was Daniel a prophet? Well, we go to the, our Lord's words on the Mount of Olives, the Olivet Discourse. And the Lord said, when you therefore see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. So the Lord calls Daniel a prophet. Moses is a prophet. And yet they are not found in that group, that division, that middle division, the prophets. And finally, David. Was David a prophet? Well, we listen to Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost. The patriarch David, that he has both died and been buried, and his monument is amongst us to this day, being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn to him with an oath of the fruit of his loins to set upon his throne. So Daniel was a prophet, but he's not found in that division of the prophets. Moses was a prophet, but he's not found in that division of the prophets. And David, too, he was a prophet, but he's not found in that middle division known as uh, the prophets. We just re remind you that the Lord divided the scriptures into three divisions, the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. It might help us in understanding something the Lord said in Matthew 23. Let me read to you verse 35. The Lord says that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, the son of Barachias, whom ye slew between the altar and death. The death of Zacharias is recorded in Second Chronicles chapter 24. Now I hope you're following because the blood of righteous Abel, where do we read about Abel? In the book of Genesis. And where do we read about the stoning of Zacharias? Second Chronicles. Genesis is the first book of the Hebrew scriptures. Second Chronicles is the last book. It comes last. Now, in our Old Testament, it is the book of Malachi that comes last. But in the Hebrew scriptures, it is Chronicles. And so what the Lord is saying, from the first book in the canon of scripture, Hebrew scripture, the Old Testament, to the last book in the Hebrew canon, whether it be Abel or Zacharias or all those who died in between, there has been an ongoing witness 
of the long history of murders that has marked the whole course of the Jewish people. And the Lord knew it would, cul it would cul culminate in the murder of their own Messiah. I'm not being irreverent when I say the Lord Jesus was saturated with scripture. It would have been impossible to be in his presence without scripture being mentioned. His mind, his head was full of scripture. And in one sense, this should be, it shouldn't be a mystery to us. Because after all, he is the incarnate Logos, is he not? He is the living word of God. I have a good friend who, when he goes walking, he carries in his pocket little pieces of card that he's laminated. And on the, on the laminated card, he has verses from the scriptures. And as he walks, he keeps taking these cards out of his pocket to look and to memorize the scripture. The walker wants to put the scriptures into his head. And I don't know how the Lord Jesus, how he assimilated the scriptures. I don't know how he, who is the personification of wisdom, I don't know how he, as Luke tells us, increased in wisdom. How can he who is wisdom increase in wisdom? But the scripture says he increased in wisdom. Do you know how the book of the Acts begins? All that Jesus began to do and teach. When confronted by the devil in the wilderness and the temptations, the first of the temptations, command these stones to be made bread. The Lord said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's his teaching. That's his teaching to us. That we should live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. But notice, he's teaching this. As he quotes this verse from Deuteronomy chapter 8, he's teaching us. It's a lesson for us. But please notice, the book of Acts says, which he began to do and then to teach. If he was telling us that we should live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, know this, he was doing that before he taught it. He absorbed the scriptures. He loved the scriptures. I have here a quote from C.A. Coates. He says, I suppose every saint must have known what it is to live by some word of God that God has spoken. But his beloved son lived by every word of God. As I said, the Lord Jesus oozed scripture. Just recently, listening to a sermon in Psalm 40, it struck me as I was thinking about the meeting tonight. Let me, let me read to you from Psalm 40. It's quoted in Hebrews chapter 10. You're familiar with these verses. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened, burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O oh my God. And the writer to the Hebrews stops there. But the next clause is important. Yea, thy law is within my heart. So that messianic psalm is telling us that the law of God was in his heart. And when he was saying that man shall live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, he was teaching that for, for us, but he could only teach it because he himself had been doing it in those hidden years 
in Nazareth. Now, there's nothing new under the sun. So most of you will have heard this before. But David, when he took on the giant Goliath, he went down to the brook and he cho chose five smooth stones and he put them in a shepherd's bag. And then David hasted, I love this, and he ran towards the ranks to meet the Philistine. This was no coward. This was a young man in the vitality of youth running to take on the opponent to the Lord's people. And he had with him five smooth stones. Those five smooth stones have been likened to the five books of the Pentateuch, the law of Moses, written in his heart, in his heart, as Psalm 40 says. But how many of the stones uh, did David use? One. How many stones, how many of the books of the Pentateuch did the Lord use when he took on Satan? One. On all three temptations, he quotes from the book of Deuteronomy. Now, could I just uh, draw to one side and go off at a, a tangent? Uh, I don't know if there are any young people in the hall tonight, or uh, even on Zoom, but let me encourage you to go in for the things of Christ in your young, productive years. There was a, a speaker called Jim Dixon, and he came down to take our conference at, on, uh, in South Shields many, many years ago. And he was staying with a dear couple who were spiritual parents to my wife and I. Now, remember what he said. He was encouraging me to go in uh, uh, for the reading of the scriptures. He said, he said, young man, it's what you do with the first 10 years of your life that lays the foundation for where you're going spiritually. Now, I want to draw to one side because I think one of the saddest pictures that we have in the scripture is found in the opening chapter of 1 Kings. King David was old, advanced in years, and they put covers on him, but he could not get warm. Ah, uh, this is not the young man now that ran to meet Goliath, is it? There's no running anywhere now. He's just sitting there wrapped in blankets. I'll start a verse from Ecclesiastes and you'll all finish it off. Well, I don't know whether you'll all finish it off. I'll quote it to you. Remember thy creator in the days of thy youth. But that's not the finish of the verse, is it? Because it goes on to say this, before the evil days come and the years draw nigh, of which thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Oh, I say to the young people who are listening tonight, use your youth, use the vitality that you have, and put all your resources, all your eggs, as it were, in the basket of Christ. Don't get to the end of your life and look back with regret and say, oh, I've wasted my life. They tell me the cup final's coming soon. And I don't know why they do it, but they, they, have this, uh, they have this thing that they do at every cup final. They sing a hymn, don't they? Abide with me. It's a lovely, it's a lovely hymn. And I was struck recently by a line from verse 2. Swift to its close ebbs out life's little day you live 70 years life's little day you live 80 years life's little day you live 90 years 100 years like our next door neighbor life's little day i tell you young person and i stand before you tonight as a testimony of this fact life passes quickly don't squander your youthful years. Yes, run to meet the giant. 
and go with those five pebbles and more, the writings of Moses and the prophets and the writings. His knowledge of scripture, our Savior's knowledge of scripture astounded his opponents. In John chapter 7, now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up to the temple and taught, and Jesus and the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? They were astonished at his knowledge of the letters, the Hebrew scriptures. When it says he'd never learned, it means he'd never been a disciple to a rabbi. He was a carpenter. And very quickly, you'll see the scope of his knowledge. Now, you and I, we can take a Bible down off the shelf and we can flick through from Genesis to Malachi, from Matthew to, to the book of Revelation with relative ease. You think of the problems that these people in the Lord's day had of memorizing scripture. The scrolls would be, would be kept in the synagogue. And uh, I, I dare say it would be only the rich who could afford the scriptures. And yet the Lord had a profound knowledge of scripture. Many references he makes to the book of Genesis. He refers to the book of Exodus. Has not Moses given you the law? He refers to the book of Leviticus, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. He refers to the book of Numbers, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. He refers to the book of Deuteronomy, well, in the three temptations, but also thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy understanding. The Lord was familiar with that first of the three divisions of scripture. What about the prophets? Yes, he quotes from Samuel when David was hungry and he took the showbread. And for, uh, from, the, from uh, first kings, you have the queen of the south. She'll rise up in judgment against this generation. That is a reference to the queen of Sheba coming to, to visit Solomon. He quotes from Isaiah. In fact, Isaiah is the third most quoted book by the Lord. Is it not written, my house shall be called of all nations a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves? That's Isaiah and Jeremiah. His knowledge of scripture was profound. He quoted from the book of Jonah. He quoted from Hosea. On Luke 23, when the Lord is carrying his cross to Golgotha, Turning round, he said to them, daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep over me, but weep over yourselves and over your children. For behold, days are coming in which they will say, blessed are the barren and the wombs that have not borne and the breasts that have not given suck. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, fall on us and to the hills, cover us. The Lord's quoting Hosea chapter 10, verse 8 there. And then Malachi. He endorses the fact that uh, John the Baptist is the one sent to prepare the way before the Lord. What about the writings, the third division? Well, the Lord quotes it from Daniel, doesn't he? He speaks about the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Let me ask you, which is the most quoted book by the Lord? It's the book of Psalms, followed by Deuteronomy, followed by Isaiah and Exodus. Remember when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonders that he wrought and the children crying in the temple, saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, hear us now what these say. And the Lord says to them, have ye never read? He had read. He's asking them, have you never read? Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, thou hast perfected praise. He's quoting Psalm 8 too. I tell you, his mind was full of scripture. Absolutely saturated with him. It oozed out of him. We see, we see him using scripture in a wonderful way. In his hometown of Nazareth, in Luke's gospel chapter 4. For 
He's handed the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. I like this. When he opened the book, he's not, he's not starting at the beginning. It says, look, he found the place. And he turns the heads of the scrolls and he gets to Isaiah 61. And he begins to read, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And so he stops reading. Then he closed the book and he gave it back to the attendant and he sat down and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed upon him. Then he began to say to them, what a statement today, this scripture, which for centuries has been contained within Isaiah's prophecy. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And they all bore witness to him, marveled at his, the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, what did they say? Is not this Joseph's son? And then the Lord says, you will sh surely say to me this proverb. Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. How many miracles had the Lord done up to uh, Luke's gospel, chapter 4? No, no miracles. As he stands up in, in the synagogue uh, at Nazareth. But notice what he's saying. Whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. He had done ample miracles in Capernaum. And now he had returned to his roots, to his hometown. And he reads that scripture. This day, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And he said to them, assuredly, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. How could Joseph's son, the local boy, how could the carpenter, the one that seen grow up in their town, be the Messiah? Impossible, they were thinking. And Jesus, sensing their opposition, he noted two instances. He's going to use the sword of the word of God to pierce between soul and spirit, joint and marrow. And do you know what he does? He presents, he presents two incidents from the book of Kings. He says, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a great famine throughout the land. But to none of them was Elijah sent, except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. He was sent to a Gentile. There were many widows in Israel, but it was to the Gentile widow he was sent. And th then he uses another scripture. There were many lepers in Israel in the times of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. This is from 2 Kings. The other incident with the widow was from Zarephath, that was from 1 Kings. And what he does, he brings these two uh, apparently unrelated texts together. He uses the sword in a masterful way. In a masterful way. Boy, he really pricks them when he tells them that the Gentiles were blessed at the expense of the Jewish nation who were in blindness to their infidelity to God. But I said he uses his sword skillfully. That's why he stops in the middle of the verse in the synagogue. You all know this. He stops right in the middle of that verse to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And he stops there because had he read on, he would have read and the day of vengeance of our God. He had come to proclaim liberty to the captives. He hadn't come to bring in the day of vengeance of our God. It will come. And what I'd like to do, I would like to consider how the Lord uses scriptures in his final hours. But before, before we do that, 
you may recall that on a number of occasions, at least three occasions, the Lord gathers the disciples around him as he approaches Jerusalem and he tells them what's going to happen. We're going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be handed over to the Gentiles. They're going to mock me and whip me and they're going to spit upon me and they're going to crucify me. And after three days, I will rise again. Well, I'd like to ask you a question. You read your Bible. When was the last time the Lord Jesus spoke about his resurrection? I'll give you the answer to that uh, question uh, in a moment, but there's something for you to be thinking about. When was the last time the Lord spoke about his resurrection? In the upper room, the Lord Jesus said these words, the son of man goes as it is written of him. His mind full of scripture, oozing out, as it were, from his pores, the law of God in his heart. He says, I'm going as it is written of me, whether it be in the first division of scripture, the law of Moses, or whether it be in the second division of scripture, the prophets, or whether it be in the writings, the third division, the Psalms, which is the first book in that third division. We'll go into the upper room. And he's got so much on his mind. He knows that he's hours away from the sufferings of the cross. And now he's, he's stooping down to wash the filth of the feet of the disciples, including a Judas. And he said to them, we break into that event. He saith unto them, he that is washed needs not to wash save his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. For he knew him who would betray him. Therefore, he said, ye are not all clean. Listen to verse 18. I speak not of you all. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He that eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Here he is in the upper room. He's washed their feet. He's dried their feet. And he's surrounded by the 12 disciples, including the one who's going to betray him. And his mind has got the scripture there. He that eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. That the scripture might be fulfilled. He's, the Lord's quoting there from the third division of that scripture, the writings, the Psalms. Psalm 41. Yea, mine own, I'll, I'll quote Psalm 41, two, verse 9. Yea, mine own familiar friend in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. I remember being in a meeting just as a young Christian on the west side of Newcastle, listening to a, a Bible teacher called Mr. Al, Mr. Albert Leckie. And he says, you'll notice when the Lord quoted Psalm 41 in the upper room, he, he, he was very careful where he started. He was very careful in the words that he used. I'll quote that Psalm to you again. Mine own familiar friend in whom I trusted. You don't find that clause, that phrase in the upper room in whom I trusted. He never trusted in Judas. He knew what he was from the beginning. See how, how intelligent the Lord is in the scriptures. But then we were still in the upper room and we're in uh, John chapter 15. And the Lord says, if I had not done among them the works which no other man did, they had not had sin. But now they've both seen and hated both me and my father. But this cometh to pass, that the word might be fulfilled, that is written in the law. They hated me without a cause. So once more, he's in the upper room, but his mind is saturated with scripture, and it's coming out. The words are coming out of his mouth. 
As it is written in their law, they hated me without a cause. He's quoting from Psalm 69. They that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. What must he have been thinking about? Because he would be familiar with the other verses of that psalm. Verse 9, the zeal of thy house has devoured me up. Verse 21, they gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they give me vinegar to drink. So he's washing their feet, but he's thinking of scripture. He's expressing that the world hates him without a cause, but he's thinking of scripture. And in Luke, in Luke chapter 22, he's in the upper room after the supper. For I say unto you, this that is written must be accomplished in me that he was reckoned amongst the transgressors. I, I, I hope you can just see the picture. All of this going on in the upper room, knowing what awaits him beyond the city, beyond the Garden of Gethsemane. And yes, his mind is pouring upon scripture and it's oozing out, as it were, the pores in his skin. Now he's quoting from He's quoting from Isaiah 53, isn't he? Now he's quoting from the prophets. All that is written must yet be accomplished in me. He was reckoned among the transgressors. For the things concerning me have an end. And he went out and went, as he was wont, to the Mount of Olives. I've written in my, my, the margin of my Bible, Regarding Isaiah 53, verse 12, he was numbered with the transgressors. I put there the mathematics of heaven. I struggled at maths at school. When I saw the boys in my class going on to do ad maths and applied maths, boy, I was totally lost. But I like this, the mathematics of heaven. He was numbered with the transgressors. I tell you, there was a thief that hung by him that day, who when he left the cell to go to the place of execution, his prospects were zilch and zero, minus, minus. But because he met that man on the middle tree, and the mathematics of heaven worked in his favor and turned a prison into paradise. But then they sing a hymn. When they had sung a hymn, most likely it was Psalm 118. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. And they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then saith Jesus unto them. So they've, they've left the upper room. They're making their way over Kedron's brook. They're making their way to the Garden of Gethsemane. And he says to them, all ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. He's quoting from Zechariah chapter 13. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd. You, you, you see what I'm, what I'm getting at here? He was just so full of scripture. It just poured out of his mouth. But notice what he said. All ye shall be offended because of me. Someone has said what pathos in these words. Because of me offended. He's every right to be offended because of me. And perhaps you would stand shoulder to shoulder with me and say, he's every right to be offended because of us. But what right have we to be offended in him? Now, I ask you a question. And the question was, when was the last mention of his resurrection? Well, it's between the upper room and the Garden of Gethsemane. I, I, I don't even 
discovered this recently. The sheep of the flock should be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you to Galilee. So you understand this? Between the upper room and the garden of Gethsemane, he's telling them he's going to rise again. Not one of them were listening. As we said recently, he, they were, the, the disciples were hearing, but they weren't listening. And then he's arrested in the garden of Gethsemane. And Peter stands to protect him. Oh, Peter, put away your sword. Think it's not that I can, now, I can now pray to my father and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels. Listen, but how then, Peter, shall the scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be? So even in the trying circumstances of the arrest, when his, his own disciples would be scattered like sheep, his mind is on the fulfillment of scriptures. And then we see him carrying his cross to Golgotha. And he says to them, weep not for me, daughters of Jerusalem. And then he quotes, this is, uh, this is Luke chapter 23. Do not weep over me, but weep over yourselves, over your children. For behold, days are coming in which they will say, blessed are the barren and the wombs that have not born and the breasts that have not given suck. Then they shall begin to say to the mountains and to the hills, fall on us. He's quoting one of the Old Testament prophets. Does this not strike you as amazing? From the upper room, in the upper room, from the upper room, to Gethsemane, to the cross, Scriptures are pouring out. Now, I, I like this. I'm going to ask you another question. Was the Lord thirsty on the cross? How would you answer that? Could you prove to me he was thirsty on the cross? Well, the psalmist says, in my thirst, they give me vinegar to drink. Psalm 22 tells us that his tongue was cleaving to the roof of his mouth. His mouth was dry. But listen to this. The Lord was looking down and he was watching the soldiers gambling for his clothing, casting lots. And what those soldiers did not know was that they were fulfilling scripture ignorantly. But listen, yes, he was thirsty, but listen to, listen to what John tells us. After this, knowing that all things were now finished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, says I thirst. And there was a vessel full of vinegar. You know the, how it goes. Oh, come with me and stand with me at Golgotha. Look up and see that disjointed body hanging there. He's just seconds away from dismissing his spirit. And he says, I thirst, not because he was thirsty, but in order that the scripture might be fulfilled. Then on the cross, that third hour again, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. There's no mention that this, he, he, though he said it, there's no mention that it was a fulfillment of scripture. But of course, he was well aware of Psalm 22. There was an artist called James Tissot, and he, he painted the cross. But he, the artist, he was painting the cross as seen by Christ on the cross. So you don't see the body of Christ because you're seeing what Christ saw on the cross. The gamblers and the scribes and the Pharisees, his own mother. What does he see? Psalm 22 verse 7, all they that see me laugh me to scorn. 
Matthew 27, likewise, the chief priests also mocking with the scribes. The Lord familiar with Psalm 22, verse 8, let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. Matthew 27, he trusted upon God, let him save him now, if he will have him. And so he says, he knows he's fulfilling scripture. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. But the Lord Jesus was confident in his resurrection. In the parable of the tenants of the vineyard, you know, they took him. This is, this, this is the, the son, this is the heir, come let us kill him. And they take him outside of the vineyard and they kill him. But then he goes on to say, have you never read? Have you never read the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. Well, I've lost my watch, which is a very dangerous thing to do. Four minutes left, eh? I was listening to a tape or an MP3 file by Albert Lecky. He was speaking about Isaiah 53, and he said something which I've logged. I've put it on the sticky side of my memory. He said, the Old Testament presents the death of Christ prophetically and typically. And in the New Testament, the death of Christ is presented historically and doctrinally. And he was speaking about the death of Christ announced prophetically. And he said there are two great portions of the word of God that announced the death of Christ prophetically, Psalm 22. And Isaiah 53. But you know, in both of those prophetic scriptures that speak of his death, we also have his resurrection mentioned. Psalm 22, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. I'll come back to that. Isaiah 53. Thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see a seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of Jehovah shall prosper in his hand. Therefore, will I assign him a portion with the great. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong. That verse, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. That's quoted in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 2. But the writer quotes the Septuagint, the, the Septuagint which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures. And there's, there's a little difference there, which I really enjoy. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. The last time he sang was in the upper room, Psalm 118. This verse in Hebrews tells me he's going to sing again. But I've got to bring it to a close. But I want to finish with this. The Lord had implicit trust in the scriptures be it the writings of Moses, be it that division known as the prophets, or be it that division known as the writings of the Psalms, he said the scripture cannot be broken. Now I've got more stuff to say here, but I can't say it. The meeting's coming to a close. My watch says I've got a minute left. What did he say to the two on the road to Emmaus? Oh, fools, fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. If we take nothing else away from this meeting tonight, we can take away this fact that we can rest upon 
the scriptures. They are absolutely on the solid foundation of God's immutable character. Mr. Darby says Christ owned them. What we call the Old Testament, he owned. And he owned it as we and the Jews have it. We have the scriptures that Christ had. And as he had confidence in those scriptures, let us not have this charge laid against us. Oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Now, I finish with this. All that the prophets have spoken. Now, you, you might be saying, is that just the middle division of those three divisions of scripture? Moses, the prophets, and the writings? No. We said right at the start that Moses was a prophet. And we said that the psalm is written by David. He was acknowledged as a prophet. And Daniel also in the section of the, the writings, he was also a prophet. Or oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. And I close with this. The scriptures that spoke about his death and the Lord knew all of them that had to be filled also speak about his coming again, his future to set up his kingdom on planet Earth. These things will be fulfilled. Remember what he said, the things concerning me have an end. I, I hope the word of God has been a, a blessing uh, to you.